Peace, peace. Nejanakumara, the Dedanumara, Anukumara. Nejanakumara, the Dedanumara, Anukumara. Nejanakumara, the Dedanumara, Anukumara. Greetings, family. This is your brother, Kepra Pata. Today we want to have the part two to Amira in the Sacred Breath. So I'm going to review a little bit that we had talked about last time. And we spoke about the necessity of the breath, as well as how the universe breathes in and breathes out, and how all living things do this in correspondence with the universe. I guess we want to get down into the solution tonight. Now, in today's world, we see that there's a lot of anxiety. Uh, people are immensely scattered, foggy-headed. It's due to a lack of oxygen reaching the brain. Now, a lot of times we get into a situation we find ourselves breathing from the chest instead of the diaphragm. And all this does is complicate the problems more and we get used to breathing this way, we'll discover that there's more anxiety and um, less calmness, more stress and so forth. It's important to understand the correct way of breathing and how we can navigate our lives with the sacred breath and how we can actually expand on our energy field. It is the breath that gives us life. Amen is the breath of the very life of creation Peace. What's going on, my brother? How you doing tonight? Glad to have you with us. Brother Heru. So it's by tapping into the world of the unseen that brings harmony to the world around us. Um, the world that we see with our eyes and so forth. And just as the breath, oxygen is invisible, so is the all-pervading intelligence. We call Ua Netev. Ashe. It is through the breath in which we unify the upper and the lower, the inner and the outer. And it's the unification of our inner-verse and the outer-verse which brings harmony to our universe. That's right. They call it prana. But just as life manifests from the primordial ocean of nothingness, it is back to the primordial ocean of nothingness that we all must return. However, just because we say it's no thing in particular, it does not mean that that is the end of your consciousness when you return back to this ocean of nothingness. Hence, it is the breath, the in-breath and the out-breath in which we experience not only in our personal lives, but as we in sync with the universe itself. Because just as we have the Big Bang, we also have the Big Crunch. So the universe expands, the universe contracts. There's aspects of polarity of expansion and contraction. This is our existence, family. So when it comes to raising the Jed Pillar, and my brother Haru Hekai talked about the Jedi, we are the Jedi returning, okay? So we are all gonna get together and raise this Jed Pillar, and we're gonna transform our lives. When you transform your personal life, the whole universe around you changes. So raising a Jed Pillar is dealing with having a straight backbone. It is the one who has a straight backbone along with the correct breathing in which we have a healthy circulation of life force energy. The human body is the network of nerves that carry instructions from the brain as well as with electrical charges. Ujahi, Ujahi brother. The importance of a strong auric field is when it is in solid condition, it keeps out the crap coming from the brain and heart signals sent out by those around you. And a lot of times we encounter people uh, that don't want to see you happy, right? You encounter people that don't want to see you succeed because they may see you as competition. Some people are just not happy and don't want to see others happy, let's face it. Or they're energy vampires and so forth. So it's real easy to attract negative energy, especially if you're thinking about this sort of thing all the time. But when you think about the world that you want to create, as opposed to the world that you see as being a living hell, because the media is going to continue to show you this. They're going to continue to show this with propaganda and so forth because they're trying to put it into your mind to create a hellish existence for yourself. And that's how they feed off of you. So we're going to transcend that tonight. 
So when you talk about prayer and meditation with breath cultivation, it will expand your aura and give you more of a sense of presence. I call it respiration. Now we have talked about the high breath, so I'm going to go over that. Through careful observation of the book of coming forth um, by day from night, also known as the Egyptian Book of the Dead, or the Papyrus of Ani, which is the most popular copy, as well as the Coffin Text, the Pyramid Text, and so forth, we see that the ancients put a lot of emphasis on breathing, and we see where the sacred breath is identified with the Ankh, mistaken for an Egyptian cross, but this symbol is known as the key of life. I call it the key of experience to the phenomena of being. It is through experiencing the phenomena of being that we can take it to the next level, you see. You have to have a physical body in order to manifest a life and live this life. You see what I mean? Because the problem is that a lot of times we talk about having a physical body as if it's a, it's a bad thing, but it's actually a good thing because the Creator experiences the fullness of its being through your physical form, okay? So that you can grow and evolve and develop that light body so when you transition up on out of here, you have the vehicle to move to the next level. So. The symbol, which is the Ankh, the key of experiencing the phenomena of, breathing, of being and breathing. And there are many depictions and pictograms of Hetharu or Hathor, where she has placed the key of life to the lips of the deceased so that they may breathe again, where the breath is restored to those in the afterlife with the sacred breath of life. So in the book of Knowing the Creations of Ra, we are taught that the Creator sneezed out Shu and spat out Tefnu. And we look at a lot of your modern African traditions, you may see that they'll breathe into a bowl or breathe into um, some water or even some alcohol and they'll spray the area. The same concept because the creative principle is being activated and utilized. That was utilized in Kemet. There's still surviving elements of that still today. So we are seeing that the creation is brought forth with that yin and yang principle. That's what Shu and Tefnut is. Shu the sneeze, the heat, and the tefnu is the spit. So that's dealing with the fire and water principle. That the fiery and watery principle is when you get the vapor, which allows you to rise. The sublimation allows us a rising of consciousness to a higher levels of being. The ancient ones also attributed this ability to speaking and calling things into existence. So when I had spoke to a student years ago um, dealing with the Hawaiian shamanism, they had revealed to me that there was an African connection to a Hawaiian Huna tradition and so forth. In fact, a lot of indigenous traditions you'll discover worldwide are very similar, okay? Especially when it comes to like facing the four directions, um, utilizing certain forms of breath techniques, you'll see how universal this stuff is, okay? But anyway, the Hawaiians referred to those who had come forth on the boat as Hali because they noticed that they did not breathe whenever they did their prayers and when they did their rituals. And this because when they arrived to the Hawaiian Islands, you know, the indigenous was like, hey, hold up, you're not going to utilize any type of breathing technique, you just go directly into prayer. This was alien to them. So, to them, the breath is necessary because it helps to generate what they call mana, which is very similar, or the same concept is what they call in the East Prana. It's the same thing. Breath is necessary to not only regulate the human voice, but it also has to produce sound itself. So all of that was utilized in this tradition. So the Hawaiians utilized Ha whenever it was time to pray and invoke spiritual forces and during the rituals. Um, something else is that this breath is utilized in West African traditions and ceremonies as well. It includes like working divination in the Ifa system where they'll take the opuele and they'll go ha, 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 ha. Same thing. You go ha, four times. So whenever you're going to do a prayer, if you're going to pray or go into meditation, you can try this technique. And this is just one thing that you can try among a whole lot of other things that you may know. Um, sit up straight and you can breathe into the nose. You breathe out. You breathe in again. And two more times. That's the four high breaths. And then after that, you go into the prayers. 
So you say, I give thanks and praise to the divine. I give thanks and praise to the supreme mother, father, divine ancestral field. But you open up the way for opportunities for me so that I can move up in life. So that I may have all the opportunities to develop spiritually, meet new people and travel in different directions that will allow me to grow, expand and develop the energy and to complete the great work. That's just an example, freestyle. But whenever you pray, you can utilize those three or those four high breaths. This will put you in not only the state of prayer, but it also will tap into that oxygen to get the oxygen flowing into your brain. And the sound is also linked to the energy of the heart. If you get into Chinese medicine, you discover that they say, ha, or ha. Same thing, it works with the heart energy and it helps the heart expand when you're feeling down and depressed and so forth. You work with that heart energy and then that will help lift that feeling away, okay? So in many indigenous cultures, we see that the number four is sacred because it represents not only the four elements but also the four directions. Um, whenever the Hawaiians would begin a prayer, they would sit straight like I showed you and make that ha sound. And you'll also see this in other traditions as well or the word ha, or the word hey, and so forth. The breath would take a full drawing in with that ha sound extending from the longer breath. So it's believed that whenever this breath is utilized for divine purposes, it will produce the mana, as I mentioned earlier. So going back over this, mana is the same as chi, prana, ashe, and in the comedic tradition, tir nature, or shekham energy. Not to mention, they also believe that the human constitution consists of a high self, a lower self, and a middle self. The middle self is your conscious mind. The lower self will correspond to your subconscious mind, and a high self corresponds to what is called your superconscious. And this makes the connection with what they call the Amakua, the guardian, mother, father, spirit that connects us with the ancestral field. And this is what the Hindus call the Paramatman, a.k.a. the Oversoul. This would be the Ba. Unlike the ka, which can be fed, will dissipate if neglected. It is through these meditation techniques and breathing techniques and methods that gives us access to, uh, to utilize this energy that builds this, this ashe, this uh, tenature, prana, mana, chi, universal life force energy, and so forth. So it's beneficial to start your prayers and meditations and rituals with the repetition of that particular breath. This technique will work with prayers of any tradition, and I encourage you to write out a prayer and say it three times. The first recital, this prayer would be for your middle self. The second recital would be for your low self. And the third would be for your high self. And the part of you that is seen, the Ra part, the part of you that opens the connection between heaven and earth is Pata. So the unseen aspect of you is Amun, which is also the breath. So blockages in one's personal energy field is a result of an imbalance. Our physical bodies being composed of matter is held together with 14,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. And amazingly enough, our bodies are composed of atoms full of empty space as well as having empty space between every atom. So in essence, we are luminous beings, each with our own aura. And if your aura is luminous, you will become more attractive not only to other people, but also to other beings on a more subtle level of existence. And these beings are what we call guides, angels, and elevated ancestors and so forth. So it's the activation of the light body, the ku, which makes us luminous beings. It is through the breath that we awaken that which is within, which is incorruptible, incorruptible what is known as the sahu. It's the purification of self and the activation of our light body, which renders us as individuals awakening and evolving into divine beings. So when the heart is purified, it becomes as light as the ostrich feather. Whenever a person has a heart that is full of impurities, that is heavy, with sadness, depression, anger, and so forth, this denies you of the immortality in which you're looking for. So it's overcoming these things, right? There's ways that you can actually ignore your thoughts. And when you ignore your thoughts because the mind has a way of taking you away from the things that you're doing, let's say you're washing dishes, dishes and you're thinking about a whole lot of other things. Well, just ignore your thoughts and see how you feel energetically because a lot of times when you are scattered, you feel tired because your energy is all over the place. So you want to make that, make it so that the energy is present. And sometimes it's ignoring your thoughts and not judging the thoughts in which you have. Um, I remember a lady asking me about meditation. If she could experience meditation, um, 
she had all these thoughts and if she could have visualized the thoughts going into a dumpster and I was like, no, nah, you don't want to do that because now you're exerting energy trying to keep that image of that dumpster there. So what you do is that you just ignore your thoughts, okay? So a little bit of, um, little bit of Egyptology in the British Museum, there is the popular papyrus of Kemet, uh, the judgment scene of Unefer where uh, he is standing next to the jackal-headed Anubis, or Anpu, and they are before the scales of Ma'at. Then you have Apuat, who observes the beam and reports the position of the scales to Tahuti, who writes the name of the person in the scroll of life, and gives Hunefer the right to go before Asar. So this is the result of all of Hunefer's good deeds. Now if he was found unworthy, his heart would be given to Amit, the soul eater, in which Hunefer would be denied immortality, and this is from what we call the chapter coming forth by day from night. So, whenever you get caught up on all these negative emotions and you're feeling shame and guilt, right there your heart is being swallowed. Your heart is being made to be heavy. And you cannot be makaru, you cannot be true of voice, because the guilt and the shame will not allow you to be that. You see, so we have to overcome these feelings of guilt and shame so we can move forward. Nephrim and Divine Harmony. The symbol known as Nefer represents the lungs and trachea. So it is the truth that the lungs and the trachea not only help us to breathe, but it also helps us make musical notes, aka sound vibrations. Now, when you read the Purdim Haru in Budge's translation, he also has a few of the notes that were found in the walls where it says that one of the things that the netter hates is too much talking. In other words, when you're constantly talking and chattering and bumping your gums, what you're doing is that you're sending out a whole bunch of frequencies into the universe because talking is considered a magical thing. So if you're talking about things with an intent, you're making things manifest as you speak. Hence the word abracadabra that's used in magical circles. Abracadabra comes from an Aramaic word which means I create as I speak. So in the Kamishan tradition, it teaches us that Pata, in some cases Atum, created the heavens and the earth through divine utterance. So our universe is held together with light and sound. So remember, everything around you that is solid consists of light slowed down. Nefer is beauty and harmony. So in order for the breath to be sufficient, there has to be the balance in the body, the balance of circulation, and blockages must be cleared so the life force energy can electrify and oxygenate the bloodstream as well as the brain. And this is why it's so important for the breath to breathe from the diaphragm as well as to uh, have the perfect alternative nostril breathing so that both hemispheres of the brain can be stimulated. One of the ways you can do this is breathing in and breathing out. Do that for like maybe a two or three minutes when you first wake up. And what you're doing is that you're cleaning the impurities out of your blood, out of your energy field, and you're also balancing two, the two brain hemispheres, the left and the right, okay? So the body is like a machine. You just have to know how to work with it and how to get the energy to circulate so that it will work correctly and you don't short circuit yourself throughout the day. Um, in the East, they got the seven uh, energy centers known as the chakras, right? They talk about the three lower chakras and then there's the heart center and then there's the three higher chakras and so forth. So it's good to work with all of these energy centers, not just the higher ones and not just the lower ones because you want to become a fully integrated being and so forth. So this corresponds to what I talked about earlier. You have your middle self, the lower self, and the higher self, according to uh, the Polynesian tradition. So full activation of the light body, known as the Ku in the Kemetic tradition, um, as well as making our body to awaken the incorruptible self, the Sahu, is the frequency of a number of breaths in which you utilize per minute that determines your state of awareness and is good to slow down the breath and so forth. Now, um, I talked about the Sahu being an incorruptible body. In ancient Kemet, they would actually mummify what they would call mummification, where they would make the body to be incorruptible because they understood that if the body was around, you can make a shrine out of that, and then you can actually feed the mummy, 
right? And you will feed the ka that actually arises from the mummy or still floating around the mummy. So when you get the names of your ancestors, right, you're calling upon their names, you're activating the ren so that you're attracting their ka because then you feed them and you put out food on the altars and so forth. You're still feeding the energy of the ancestors. Even if the ancestor may have reincarnated or moved on, the ka of the ancestor is still around and can do things once you feed it. And if you neglect it, what it will do is dissipate after a while. So this is an ancient African teaching that still exists today in various African traditions. But moving on. Another way to address um, the various trance states is the slower the breath, the deeper the trance state. The ultimate goal is transcendence, which is used the end of our trance, the awakening, the transcendence. So you want to end the trance because what it is, is throughout the day, you're going, I don't know who would call me in the middle of me doing a video. I think that's rude, but they're on messenger calling me, so I'm not going to answer them right now. But anyway, so the ultimate goal is transcendence. The awakening where one becomes fully aware of the simultaneity of past, present, and future. It is with the undifferentiated nature of our innermost spirit that gives us access to pure conscious awareness. It remains unconditioned in a world that is forever transforming and changing, building up and breaking down, expanding and contracting and so forth. The breath and the flow of one's thoughts go hand in hand. The all is mind, the universe is mental, as I said earlier in part one. The life force energy is directed with the breath, hence the Shechem energy of prana, mana, chi, ki, and so forth. This describes an energy source that exists within us and around us, in the air, and so forth. So breath control um, can assist in a cutting down on the invasive thoughts. Because the more you breathe, the more you expand your auric field, and the more you're in a state of relaxation, the thicker your aura becomes. A lot of times when you have a thin aura or a contracted aura, you're subject to other people's thoughts, how other people feel about you, and you'll pick up on that. So the power is in the present. Worries, doubts, fears, which are evidence of an imbalanced vagus nerve, chip away with our power of the nowness, a.k.a. the presence. And so in the West African word, we have a word for... Um, for our command, and that word is ashe. So when you say ashe at the end of the prayer, you're saying let it be so because you are commanding something to happen. See, so you'll find this in various traditional uh, uh, traditions around the world is that you develop the ability to speak things into existence. You develop what is called command. If you study magic or anything like that, you have to understand that you're given a power to command the forces, but it has a lot to do with being a solid being and being present and knowing what you want and being able to concentrate on it because if you're scattered, it will not manifest. We live in a society that scatters us. So the whole thing that you want to do is make sure that you can focus and become integrated and become part of the now, the N-O-W, because you spell it backwards and you have won. Okay? So the West African word for command is Ashe. Its interpretation of mean command implies the power of your presence. You see? That's why they're talking about, in a tradition, Eshu comes about to give you um, a certain amount of options. And you're supposed to choose and focus. Because if you're scattered, you will not be able to manifest your destiny. You know, every, each and every one of us have a destiny in which we live. So if you live your destiny, then you'll be fulfilled. And then you don't have to keep coming back, you know, doing this over and over and over again. So there's the Ashe, there's the Mojo, the Shechem, the Chi, and the ability to make things manifest with full awareness in the present moment. And generating a feeling. You have to have a certain feeling whenever you do a prayer. Whenever you meditate and visualize, you invoke a feeling to make this thing happen because the feelings actually attract things to you. But when you're scattered and not integrated and you tend to function with a compromised energy field, you will see that there's an inability to manifest the things that you desire to take place in your personal life. So worry, anger, revenge, thoughts, and all these things that take us from our center and scatter our energies, allowing for the op opposing energies to manifest and bring in balance, right? This is why if you do want to do things, even if you want to battle negative energy, it's about having a sense of focus. Because one of the reasons why these bad guys keep on getting over is because they care about what they're doing, you see? If you don't care about what you're doing, right, it's just something for the moment, then of course it's not going to manifest. So the secret, one of the secrets of getting things to manifest in our lives is to put some care into it. 
you know so a lot of people who set up altars and shrines and they're working with different deities and they care for the deities then they notice that things happen in their life because the deities embody intelligences and principles that exist and govern the universe if you care about these things and you nurture these things then you will see that they develop in your life and you attract circumstances to you that are in accordance understood so yes this is to the development of the will to being able to focus and take care of the things that are that um, will get you to the next level and one of the things is by integrating it with your life force this is why you go into trance so that you can develop that will because then the will will take over automatically when you have put yourself under a certain form of trance and you focus on the things that you want and then you will get those things when you're a child if you focus on something enough it'll come to you will get it but you see we were told that you can't have things we started believing people telling us that there's things that you can't do at an early age up to the age of seven okay so it is important for us to start getting our stuff now but we have to go back to those times and get in the meditation and we have to erase the programming and transform it with new stories because it's the stories that we have in the back of our mind that continues to tell us over and over and over again that you cannot, you can't, it will not happen, it cannot happen. And because we believe that, we live accordingly. So through meditation, breath, and self-awareness, we learn that we can ascend to the heights by grounding ourselves. And this is how we live our truth. In a commission pan uh, pantheon, there's a netert called Ma'at. And she's kneeling in her arms and her wings are outstretched right as if she's about to take flight this very poll suggests that we are to sin or stay within the heights by grounding ourselves in truth she has wings yet she is kneeling so in order to take flight you have to first ground yourself you see so if you want to ascend the heights then you have to take a look around you and see what's around you and become aware we have to be grounded you see but a lot of people want to work on the upper chakras they don't want to work on their lower chakras and their space cadets they're not fully integrated you want to be fully integrated if you want to transcend so going back to the pose of my eye it talks about living in truth so the way you ascend is by living truth that's being grounded when our when we live truth we'll see where it's necessary to reach that inner peace this inner peace results in the lightening of the heart a heart that is devoid of heaviness and impurity and balanced with the ostrich feather on the beams of the scales of ma'at hence we realize immortality with the balance of the mental body and the emotional body when there is disruption in our mental and emotional body dis-ease and other manifestations um, that that come in like accidents and so forth even car wrecks all of this because there's an imbalance in our subconscious that comes to the surface and allows us to be put in these situations where we'll experience these things okay so we also want to keep in mind that sound gives form to the light and the whole universe thrives on tones frequencies and sound vibrations the word universe means one song one phrase Pythagoras who had been a student of Comitian mysteries for 22 years understood that the planets represented musical notes hence the music of the spheres the human voice which is utilized and produced with the breath makes the musical notes so in order to project the sound and hit those notes there must be a coordination with the breath hence the priest of the commission uh, legacy in the text they utilize hymns the commission tradition the lungs are governed by happy in Chinese medicine if there's an issue with the lungs you'll be depressed right so there's the sound that they use with the lungs where they just go, they visualize um, the color white around the lungs and go Sss, like a snake or Sss, depending on the tradition. And what you'll do is you will visualize the lungs being filled with light and go Sss. breathe it in and out again. Go do it two more times. Did 
There we go. Hissing like a snake, right? Be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Hmm. That's another teaching for another day. For those who understand, you know, when they have a flying out of a bird and a serpent, that represents unification of the upper and lower self. This says in the Bible, be, be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. But when you combine the two, you get the caduceus staff, which represents the raising of the life force energy. But we'll talk about that another time. But it's important to take care of the lungs. If there's an imbalance in that energy, you will feel depression. Okay? And it's also due to a poor circulation of chi, life force energy. We can actually raise the vibration with our ability to sing. For those who are familiar with the spiritual systems of India, you see that each chakra has its own deity and a set of sound vibrations known as seed sounds, right? So I'm gonna just go ahead and throw this out. For those who's looking for a girlfriend, you ain't got no girlfriend or, or a boyfriend or a mate, you could just go ahead and chant, clean 108 times, right? Take a bath in honeysuckle or orange peel juice, orange peel oil, and you chant clean 108 times. You can write it down 108 times. Make it manifest. Rhonda Framen, in the book in the Metal Netter, he says clean, and he sees this is connected with the Heteru uh, Hekau, right? So it's different as far as how it's spelled, K L I N G, but K L E E M is the same vibration. Write it 108 times. Say clean, do that 108 times. Clean, clean. You can do it with K-L-E-E-M. Clean. 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 Do that with the breath and see what happens. After a while, you're going to discover that you're meeting people of the opposite gender or, you know, depending on how, whatever way you would like to hook it up. The person that's supposed to be attracted to you will start coming into your life or you will see options of people come into your life you see so you have the ability to create things you have the ability to manifest like i said before we are creating the universe in which we live see you're on earth because you're a god in training you just have to learn how to master self right which is meaning that you are dedicated to a process in order for things to manifest in your life in the way that things can go in a certain way. How you would like to see them go, though. Not how you have to do things because of the circumstances that you find yourself in. Because your subconscious is creeping up on you and biting you in the butt. Because there's something playing in the back of your mind that could have started in your childhood. So anyway, the Pharaoh, or the Nesut Bidi of ancient Kemi, was the embodiment of Haru and the unifier of the two lands. You can also embody the two lands, which is known as upper and lower. You can be the embodiment of the upper and lower when you have your upper and lower self in harmony. Then you become Haru Smai Tawi, unifier of the two lands. So we examine the symbols used by the ancient commissions. We see a depiction of Haru, the spirit of order, and Seth, the spirit of chaos tying ropes around the lungs and trachea and implanting it into the land. And this is called Samaitawi, the unification of the two lands. Okay? Unification of the two lands represent that harmony with the higher and lower self because there's no separation between the two because they're both working together. So it's the unification that brought and restored Ma'at, balance, harmony, and truth in the land of ancient Kemet. The land outside of us represents the objective realm. Just like we have an inner world, which is known as the subjective realm. The ancient Commissions understood this, and he knew about the law of correspondence, which is as above, so below, as within, so without. In regards to what we're seeing happening around us, reflecting that which is taking place inwardly. So when those who are into alchemy and those who are into magic, whatever you're doing ritual-wise, you are transforming the environment around you. But when you practice these forms of ritual work what you're doing is that you're acting some activating something within you and you are dealing with the work on two levels in your subjective realm and the objective realm when you're working and doing any sort of work 
everything you are doing that appears to be outside is doing something inwardly as well. So just as the land is unified with the lungs and trachea, bringing order to the land, it is by your own works with the lung and trachea that brings order to your body temple. The power of breathing brings stability to the mind. This in turn brings harmony to low, high, and middle self. With proper breath circulation, we unite the two hemispheres of the brain. We are both human and divine. So when we spiritualize the matter that composes our body temple, we activate the Ku, which is the light body. So anyway, family, I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up because it's getting a little late. But we're going to have a part three. Hope to see you. And I hope that you was able to find what I shared useful. Until next time, take care. My family, sisters and brothers. Anechadak Amara, the Deterra Amara, Nuka Mara, Uncle Chasanev.